Thank you. You may be seated. Trusting and obeying. Very important keys to our Bible study this morning. We're in Exodus chapter 4. We'll be looking at those five verses that we read just a few moments ago about Moses casting down his rod, turning into a serpent, Moses running away from it, and then God commanding him to take up something that is very, very scary. God does things like that in our lives, you know, where we suddenly realize that we're in danger and God sends us back to what appears to be, in fact, very deadly danger and tells us to grab hold of it and then to do something with it. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power and for its call upon our lives, the imperative that you give to us so that we might be useful servants in your hand, doing your will, and then seeing you in a supernatural and mighty way bring about that which you have ordained. Father, we pray for your blessing upon the going forth of your word this day, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, last time we looked at what is the introduction to this text before us in the last two verses of the preceding chapter. It's a very specific promise that God gives to Moses, whereby Moses will know that those long-range promises that he has given are also going to come true. Verses 21 and 22 of the last chapter read, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. Last week we did basically a study on the three different types of prophecy that we find in that text that immediately precedes God's commission to Moses and Moses' argument against why he can't do it. <laughs> in fact, we're going to discover Moses raises lots of objections to what God wants him to do. And just sort of as an overview, one of the things that encourages me about this passage is God doesn't give up on Moses on the first try. If he did, Moses would have died long ago out in the middle of the desert somewhere and might not have even been buried. As it is, God buries Moses at the end of his life. But if Moses, on his very first objection to God, had been rejected, we would not have the book of Exodus as we have it. God would have still accomplished his purpose, but it gives us hope when we look at Moses, that recalcitrant, disobedient, stubborn, hard-willed, does not want to do it, backwoodsman. And God used him anyway. That means God can use me. That means God can use you. That means that when God has a purpose and a plan for your life, he will accomplish it, though we may have some rough going along the way, as Moses does, when he resists the will of God. There were the near-range prophecies, those short-range prophecies that happened right away. We saw some of those in the text. There were middle-range prophecies, things that happen in the future, sometime within the lifetime of those who hear the prophecies. And then there are those long-range or far prophecies, things that are going to happen in the distant future usually belong the lifespan of those to whom the prophecies were originally given. And God gives us the short range and the mid range prophecies so that we can look back and see that they've happened literally exactly and precisely like God said they were going to happen. And that's what gives us confidence in knowing that those things which are promised concerning the future are also true. We haven't seen them yet, but we know how God gives promises and keeps them. And we know that God always fulfills his promises literally. They will come to pass. And so we can be confident that future prophecies will take place exactly the same. We saw two sets of short-range prophecies in the context. The elders of Israel will be available. They'll be willing to meet with you. They'll go along with the plan to go to Pharaoh. And the second set of those short-range prophecies, Pharaoh will definitely say no, and Pharaoh will make your life more difficult with his mighty hand. 
Not a very encouraging set of short-range prophecies, at least that second set. Then we saw a couple of mid-range prophecies in that context of chapter 3. God's going to beat up Egypt and smite them with his wonders, with his plagues. He's going to do it all over Egypt, not just in the capital. And then Pharaoh will let you go. And the second set, which is the amazing set, I mean, this is amazing, really, as you think about it, as the plagues of Egypt, that the Egyptians will start liking you. You will find favor in the eyes of the Egyptians. Now, after all they've been through, and knowing that Moses was the cause, do you think they would like the Israelites more or less after that had happened? But God says you're going to find favor in their eyes. They're going to be excited about seeing you going. They'll make you rich with silver and gold and clothing. In fact, they'll give you anything you want just to get you out of town. That's a mid-range prophecy. They would see it coming down the road after all the plagues were over. And we noted that most of us like to be part of that second set of mid-range prophecy because it includes things that we always dream about, getting revenge, getting rid of our neighbors, and getting filthy rich. But if you'd been part of that set of prophecies, you'd be dead now, 3,400 years, about to start walking through the wilderness, and about uh, 40 years of nothing but banna with a few quail thrown in, in between and lots of warfare ahead. And so we concluded with saying, you know, we really don't want to envy the blessings that God gives to others because he may also give you trials that you'll have to face in the midst of that. God gave these prophecies in the context of the Abrahamic covenant, three pieces to that, the promise of a specific piece of real estate, the promise of an uncountable number of descendants, the promise that the Messiah would be a physical descendant of Abraham through Isaac. And so it wasn't just that I'm going to get you out of Egypt. I'm going to start bringing to pass all of the promises that I made to Abraham at about 1800 B.C. 400 years after God made that promise, God says, now I'm ready to move. Now I'm ready to start doing it. Don't put restrictions on how long it will take God to fulfill his promises. Believe the promises, know that they are true, and you will see someday that God fulfills them exactly like he said he would do so. And so that brings us to our text for today. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. You know, Moses is raising the same type of objections that you and I raise when we know what God wants us to do. Now, it's not that we're going to stand in front of a burning bush and have God talk to us out of a bush. Or we're not going to get a bolt of blue from heaven that suddenly writes across the sky or on the wall, like in the book of Daniel, here's what I want you to do. You're not going to suddenly get a new spectacular revelation from God where an angel hands you golden plates dug out of the hill Cumorah and tells you what he wants you to do. You have the word of God. Everything you need to know and do is right here. If you don't obey what he has already said, how can you expect him to tell you anything else? How many pages are in your Bible? If you have a Bible that doesn't have footnotes and sidebars and all the other stuff that you know are stuck in for good helps for us, how many times does it tell you in there, God said, the word of the Lord came unto me and said, the word of the Lord said, did you realize that averages three times per page all the way through the Old Testament. You have the Word of God. You know what God wants, what He expects. You know everything from the point of salvation all the way to the point of glory, what God expects of you. If we don't obey what He's revealed, why should we expect that He's going to give us a bolt of blue? No, that's not how it happens. But we have our objections. We don't want to believe what God has said. That's the real problem. Notice here, we argue with God, with what God has said. In fact, when we do that, we're calling God a liar. What had God said to Moses up to this point? Before we get to chapter 4, what had God said? God said, I've seen your affliction. I've heard your cry. I know your sorrows. That's verse 7. And then God makes a promise. 
No ifs, ands, and buts about it. It's not like the oracle at Delphi or something like that that can be taken 85 different ways. He says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. That's pretty clear. God has said, I'm going to do it. But Moses wants to argue. God also said in verse 12, certainly I will be with thee. Moses says, but, but Lord, you know, I'm kind of scared. What did God promise Moses? I will be with thee. Folks, do we have a promise like that in the New Testament? What has Jesus said? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe you didn't hear it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How long is never? I mean, from here till a year from now? From here till 50 years from now? I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Why? Because the Lord is my helper. God has just given exactly that same promise to Moses, and he has given that same promise to us. Oftentimes we look at Moses and say, Moses, why are you arguing with God? Moses, why don't you want to obey what God has told you to do? That was just to wake you up. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> That was a sign from heaven. <laughs> Why are we arguing with God? We do the same thing that Moses did. God also said something else. I will give a token unto thee. You shall serve God upon this mountain. In other words, Moses, you're going to know that what I'm telling you is true about all that stuff in the future because you're going to go to Egypt. You're going to be the tool with which I deliver Egypt. And you're going to come back to this spot. And right here on this place, you're going to serve me. Moses is still a little bit shaky about it. Verse 17, God says again, I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt. Now, could God have been any more obtuse and obscure and hidden in his meaning when he said, I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt? That's not obscure. That's as direct as you can get. Has God said he is going to be the one that does it? Yes. God told him about his relationship to the children of Israel in verses 13 through 16. God gave him specifically testable promises to prove that God would do what he had said. And he gives him all the business of the mighty works in Egypt that's going to take place, the ten plagues that are going to happen, and all that business about how rich they're going to be when they leave the land of Egypt. And God gave him some specific commandments, too. Oh, this is where Moses balks. Moses is all excited about all the things that God is going to do, as long as it doesn't involve Moses. Some of us are like that. We love to see the mighty work that God would do in this church. We pray for the mighty work that God will do in this church. We pray that hundreds of people will be saved and come to this church. And then God says, now here's your job. And we said, oh, uh, not me, Lord, make it the preacher. Make it the elders. Make it the trustees. Make it somebody else, but don't call on me. That's where our objections come. It's not in the theoretical realm. It's not in the realm of what God himself will do. It's in the realm when God says, you are going to be my instrument. You are going to be the one through which I accomplish my work in earth. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he went away into heaven didn't say, okay, you twelve, now you can relax. I'm going back to heaven. And in heaven I have myriads of angels. And I'm going to set them in a big, huge sphere around the globe of earth. And every one of them is going to have a loudspeaker, and he'll target a specific language group down there on earth and say, repent, or I'll kill you. Trust Jesus, or you'll go to hell. He said... Instead, ye are my witnesses. Not 
not you will be, you are. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Folks, that includes us. You're in what used to be called the uttermost parts of the earth. No, we think of it as the center of the universe now, in the United States of America. But here we are, and we are his witnesses. For good or for bad, whether we like it or whether we don't like it, we are his witnesses. God uses people. Never forget that. God uses people. And if you are one of his children, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior alone, you are an instrument in his hands. Moses is going to have to learn that by an instrument that Moses has in his own hand. But Moses has to come to grips with the fact that he is a chosen instrument to bear God's name before the Egyptians. And like Paul, we are chosen instruments to bear God's name to the society around us. God gave him specific commandments. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh. I'm going to send you unto Pharaoh. Now, I'm not going to send you to some little backwoods hick place where, you know, the people are already sort of waving on the edge of the gospel and you'll be just that little trigger that pushes them over the edge and they trust Christ and they get saved. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. Notice the next thing it says in that same verse, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses, you're going to do it. What? Moses looks at God like, I must be hearing things. Like maybe, the, maybe the sun has gotten to me. I've had a heat stroke. I'm having delusions out here in the middle of the desert or something. Verse 16, he says, Go, gather, speak, and give. Gives him four commands. As we look at verse 16, Go and gather the elders of Israel together. Speak to them. Give them a specific message. You are my messenger, and you are the instrument that I will use. Did you know you're a messenger? And you are the instrument that God will use. Moses' arguments fall into two different types of categories here in our passage. Number one, they fall into what looks like incipient rebellion. I really don't want to do this and don't push me too hard or I won't. You know, there's some kids like that. The parents tell them what to do. And then the parents have to walk around like they're on eggs because the kid has a rebellious spirit. And so the parent tries to cajole and, you know, coddle and a sweet talk and beg and offer all kinds of goodies. Did you know God doesn't do that? And when God has a determinative will, he will see to it, as he did with Jonah, that you will do his will, though it may be a very, very unpleasant road that you have to go down. You might have to spend some time in the gastric acids of, uh, acids of the belly of a great fish and get vomited up on dry land covered with fish vomit. Not a pleasant thought. That's the first category into which his arguments fall, incipient rebellion. The second category is the category of disbelief. Or we might say, you know, God, you mean you said that? Don't you realize, God, that that is a silly idea? I mean, that's what Moses is saying here. And calling God a liar. God has just said, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to use you, and say, oh, what a silly idea. God, I don't believe that. What are you doing? You are calling God a liar. Not a very safe thing to do. Verse 11, Moses said unto God, you know, God has just said, I'm going to use you. And Moses says unto God, what a silly idea. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He's just told God that God has a silly idea. He's just told God he doesn't believe the promise that God has just given about bringing the people of Israel out of Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. He's called God a liar, and he said, God, you have silly ideas. Do you know that every time you resist the will of God and you argue with God and you disobey what God has said in his word, you're telling God that he has silly ideas, you've got better ideas, 
And you're telling God that he's a liar, that he wouldn't really keep the promises that he made in those passages of Scripture which you've just read. Folks, that is very serious sin. The Moses arguments are based on three faulty premises. The first argument that he gives is the argument of the fear of man. The fear of man. You know, if you have promises from the sovereign God of heaven, it is very stupid to be afraid of people. We just quoted the verse out of Hebrews a moment ago, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Why? Because the Lord is my helper. Book of Proverbs says the same thing, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Why did Moses run away from Egypt in the first place? Because he was afraid of man. He'd killed the guy, buried him in the sand. Pharaoh heard about it. Pharaoh says, I'm going to go get Moses, and Moses runs for his life. Moses had, as an initial problem, that he had to get over so they get back where God was putting him. He had to get over the fear of man. Do you have the fear of man? You're afraid of other people? Oh, if I took a stand for Jesus, what would they say about me? If I witnessed, why, I might get rejected. My, my. Jesus was rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He is despised and rejected of men. But Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wherefore, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become wearied and faint in your own minds. Don't have the fear of men. Be in the center of God's will, and you don't care what happens around you. If you know you're in the will of God, if you know you're dead center on target, if you know you're focused on eternity, if you know what you're doing is pleasing Jesus Christ, don't even hesitate one step. Do what's right and leave the results to God. Oh, what an important lesson. I'm thankful that God taught me that lesson as a young child. Oh, I stumble and fall many times along the way, but I keep being brought back to that lesson. It doesn't matter what men say, it matters what Jesus says. When I stand before Christ, I will give an account for what I have done, thought, said, my motives, my, my attitudes, everything in this world, I'll give an account for it. And I want to hear, as I've said many times before, well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Is that what you want? I sure hope so. First faulty premise is the fear of man. The second is also one that I think we often fall into, though we blame the Arminians for it. But it's the expectation that success is dependent on Moses rather than God. The expectation that success is dependent on us rather than God. What is Moses arguing here? He says, Lord, they won't listen to me. They won't hear me. They won't obey me. You get it? Moses has started with the wrong premise that the success of this operation depends on Moses. How often do we say, Lord, I'm not going to obey you. I, I'm not going to believe that because, after all, you know, the success of this operation would depend on me. Look, if God is in it, on whom does the success of the operation depend? That is, if God is in it. Obviously, it depends on him. Moses taught that to a young man by the name of Joshua. And Joshua is reminded by God of that very lesson in the very opening verses of the book of Joshua. In chapter 1, verse 1 and following, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. In other words, you're not going to have him to fall back on. You're not going to have him to rely on. You're not going to have him to run to and hide behind. He is dead. Now you're next in line. Are you going to learn the lessons that it took so long to teach Moses? 
Or are you going to, having seen it in Moses' life, are you going to believe the lessons? Listen to what God says. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. You realize what God has just said? He said the same thing to Moses. He said, I want you to get up and go, and you're going to cross the Red Sea. And Joshua only had to cross the Jordan River. Moses crossed the Red Sea, but he's saying the same thing to him. And you're going to go to the land that I promised. I promised it back there to Moses. I was going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. I was going to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now arise, get the children of Israel behind you. Moses argued, they won't follow me. They won't hear me. They won't believe me. Now you get up and you get across the river. You're going to go to the land that's flowing with milk and honey. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Now he gives the same promises he gave to Moses. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life including Pharaoh with Moses and all the Egyptians. We've got a different group of people, but it's the same promise. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Exactly the same promise that's given to us in Hebrews. I quoted it a moment ago. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not fear what man can do unto me, because the Lord is my helper. Do you understand, people? The same God of the Old Testament is the God who has made promises to us. And either we believe them or we don't. Either we rebel or we don't. Either we say, God, you're silly, or we don't. Either we call God a liar or we believe him and we obey. And then the command. You don't have to fear man. And don't have to expect that your success is dependent on you rather than God. Here's what God says. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Moses, you're going to be the one. Now, Joshua, you're going to be the one. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Ah, oh, there are some conditions for them. If you want to be strong and courageous, you'd better obey me, says God. Do all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. Do you want to prosper? Do you want to prosper? Then obey what God has told you to do. Don't argue with him as Moses did. Do you want to prosper? then don't make excuses as Moses did. If you want to prosper, don't assume that what God is saying couldn't possibly be true because it seems silly to you. Verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Is God's word always before your mind, day and night? Or do you make decisions based on something besides the principles of Scripture? You make your decisions based on convenience. You make your decisions based, as we see it, Moses trying to do here, based on the fear of man. You make your decisions based on the business model of the world. You make your decisions based on peer pressure. You make your decisions based on emotions. What do you make your decisions on? Are you meditating on God's word day and night so that when you make a decision it falls directly into place with what God has commanded how a believer is supposed to live. People, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's everyday life. That's the way in which we are supposed to be living. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Did you notice two things here? It says it shouldn't depart out of your mouth. It should always be on the tip of your tongue. Be ready to give a reason to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You sanctify God in your hearts, but you make ready to talk about it. That's the first part of that verse. The second part of that verse 
says that you may observe to do. You not only talk it, you walk it. Your life has got to reflect what you are saying with your lips. Then you'll have good success. Verse 9, I love this verse. Memorize it as a little tiny child. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. This is God speaking to Joshua. This is not a suggestion. This is not ten steps to success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Oh, there we get back to that business of fear again. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Same promise God just made to Moses in the book of Exodus. I will be with thee. God promises it to Joshua. I will be with thee. Jesus promised it to the disciples and to us. Lo, I am with thee unto the ends of the earth. Is there any place on earth you can go that Jesus is not with you? Is there any time in life when Jesus is not with you? Is there any time in life when underneath are the, the hands of God upholding you? Dear people, do you believe it? If you believe it, you will live it. The third false premise that Moses has here in this text is the belief that other people can and always will withstand the sovereign, immutable will and direction of God. God has just said, this is what I'm going to do. Moses is saying, no, they won't do it. They won't do it. They won't do it. He says three things about the people. Moses answered and said, but, by the way, never say but to God. That's looking for exceptions to God's sovereign commands. That's how Moses starts. He starts with but. Never say but to God. Behold. <laughs> Moses says, but behold. God you know, look, can't you see? Can't you see what the situation is? Behold! He starts with two very bad words to start with, at least in the context. And here are the three things. Number one, they will not believe me. Number two, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, three, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. The three things. They won't believe, they won't listen, and they will argue because there's no current evidence. Doesn't that sort of strike you as familiar in the context of this passage? Doesn't it sound familiar concerning what Moses himself is doing at that point? He's not believing, he's not listening, and he's arguing because there's no current evidence. And he's using that as the excuse what they will do too. Moses is merely reflecting his own internal character when he argues against God in that manner. You know, we don't believe. We don't listen. We argue with the word of God because we have no tangible evidence that we should obey. We're usually guilty of the very things that we accuse other people of. We don't witness because our experience has told us they will not believe. We don't think that they'll listen because we've seen people who refuse to listen. We don't see any specific miraculous evidence of God working, and so we want to argue with what God has commanded us to do. Believing that people can, or that people always will, withstand the sovereign, immutable will and direction of God is a false premise. It is always ordained to the trash heap of history. Romans 9, verses 16 through 21. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Thou wilt then say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Remember something. Whenever you see God asking a question in the Bible, it's not because God is asking for information for himself. He's asking the question so that he might, by his question, instruct us. Verse 2 here, Exodus 4. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? It wasn't like God was sitting so far up in heaven, he looked down and sort of squinted, and he could see Moses, this teeny-weeny little figure down there. And he said, 
what in the world is that you've got in your hand, Moses? Could you please tell me what you've got in your hand? I don't quite get it. Can't see it, you know. Or, you know, there's a cloud cover in between us here, and so it's not really, really, really visible to me. Would you please tell me what's in your hand? God does not ask questions to gather information. God knows it. He's asking it so that he can instruct Moses. The Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. Moses had one thing in his hand. He didn't have lots of things in his hand. He had one thing in his hand. Keep that in mind in just a moment. Moses sort of looks stupidly around. Oh, what I got in my hand? It's a rod. You know, you're like, big deal. I mean, like sort of an ordinary, everyday, natural question when you're trying to keep a conversation going. What do you got in your hand? A rod. Did it ever occur to you that God had prepared something in the realm of nature from eternity past for a very specific moment in time for his glory? A rod. Do you think that you could trace the seed of the tree that grew a specific branch, that is a piece of wood, to a specific length back to the original plant in the Garden of Eden? Think you could trace that back? You look at that rod. Can you give me the history of that rod? Which one of the trees did it come out of the Garden of Eden? Its seed that grew, and then the flood, and then those seeds were scattered about in different places, and then they, they got planted, and then they grew, and then they cast seeds, and those seeds grew. And could you trace that for me? Could you trace how it ultimately grew someplace in the wilderness at a specific point in history so that it would be there when a fugitive from Egypt picked it up at a precise moment in the plan of God? Do you have any idea why this fugitive continued to carry it for years and he never had any fear of it and he used it for tending sheep driving away predators leaning on it when he was tired turning over rocks to check for scorpions beating bushes to knock down berries and a hundred of other uses do you know other than habit why he had it in his hand the day God asked him the question and he didn't have his leather jug with water or didn't have his knife in his hand as Abraham did at one other occasion, he had a stick in his hand. Do you understand his stupid, human, uncreative, unresponsive, unthinking response when he said to God, a rod? Do you understand how earthbound Moses was in his thinking about who he was and what he had when he himself was an instrument in the hand of God? That's the point that God's trying to make to him. What have you got in your hand? It's a worthless piece of wood. Moses, what have I got in my hand? Moses, you are in my hand. What do you think I can do with you? I'm going to teach you some lessons about that by what I show you about what you can do with what's in your hand. What can God Almighty do with instruments in His hands? What can Almighty God do with you and through you with the instruments that He has placed into your hands? God asks you the same question that he asked of Moses. What do you have in your hand? Don't give a stupid answer that's chained to earth. Don't give an answer that comes from the flesh. Don't give an answer that fails to see the infinite possibilities that God can do with you, his instrument, and through you with the instruments, the gifts, the talents, the money, the skills, the opportunities, your time in history, your key positions in his plan, and by his power. Don't give the earth answer. Open your eyes to eternity. Open your eyes to what God can do. He can use a worthless stick to accomplish miracles. He can certainly use you, filled by the Spirit of God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, instructed in the Word of God, and placed at a point in history. Some of you have money that you've squirreled away for some day. What do you have in your hand? What can you do with it and what can God do with it when you quit giving that stupid earthly answer, 
money. Some of you have skills and talents, abilities to be successful on earth. What do you have in your hand? What can God do with it when you quit giving a stupid earthly answer? Talents? Some of you have time to kill on your hands. What do you have in your hand? What can God do with it when you quit giving a stupid earthly answer? Time. Some of you have family that you want to keep close and like a secure fence around yourself against the dangers of the future. Rather than sending them forth, even if it be to the ends of the earth, what do you have in your hand? What can God do with it when you quit giving a stupid earthly answer? Family. Some of you have huge collections of possessions that you have surrounded yourself with to give you security. That is truly stupid. What do you have in your hand? What can God do with it when you quit giving a stupid earthly answer? Stuff. Whatever you have, are you willing to do with it what God commanded Moses to do? Verse 3, and he, that is God, said, cast it on the ground. Let go of it. Drop it. Throw it down. Give it up. Hear the call of God. Do what he says. Cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. It's only when we really let it go from our emotions, from our heart, from all that's inside of us that keeps clutching at it. It's only when we really let it go that we suddenly realize how dangerous it was, and we've been holding on to it all that time. What can God do with what's in your hand? He can use it to kill you. A serpent could kill Moses. That's why Moses ran away. Moses knew what snakes were about. It's only when we do what God says with what's in our hand that it no longer has that potential of danger for us. Cast it to the ground. Moses did, and Moses fled from before it. And then verse 4, And the Lord said unto Moses, this was tougher than the previous command. Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. <laughs> I think the Lord was kind to Moses, telling him to take it by the tail instead of take it by the head. <laughs> if God had told him to take it by the head, he would have had to take it by the head. Taking it by the tail would not have worked, and the snake would have whipped around and bit him. If you were out in some kind of a zoo that had a reptile garden, and someone broke the cage on some fearsome, venomous snake, and the snake came crawling toward you, and you heard a voice from heaven saying, take it by the tail, would you do it? Uh, we'll go back to our theology. We'll say that God doesn't speak to us out of heaven like that anymore, and so I wouldn't do it. But suppose you're in the days when God still spoke to people out of heaven like that. Would you do it? Remember, Moses is scared stiff. This is not a garter snake that it turned into. Sometimes God tells us to do things that are very, very scary, and we want to argue with him. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Never underestimate what God can do with what's in your hand. You'd better be sure that you are using it the way that God has told you to use it. And he tells you in his word how to use it. Verse 5. 
Why did God do this to Moses? It says that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. Moses has just argued. Remember, he said, they won't believe me. They, they'll say, God never appeared to you. Okay, says God, I'm going to give you something right now so that you'll have some concrete evidence so that you can't use that as an excuse. The first two excuses, they won't hear, they won't listen, you know, and then they won't believe what, I, what uh, I've told you. I'm going to give you something that you cannot argue with because it's going to be in your hand. You're going to lug it with you. We'll see Moses lugging it with him all the way down to Egypt in some later passages. It mentions it specifically on different occasions as he's making his journey back to Egypt. It's something you can hold on to. It's like one of the near promises that you've seen fulfilled. You know it happens. And God, says God, make sure you understand that. Until you cast it on the ground... You will never know what you have clutched at all these years it was a snake that could kill you. You'll never understand how dangerous and how ugly the things are that you have coveted in this world really are. Before this incident, the rod is called Moses' rod. After this incident, it is called the rod of God. I think that's instructive because you see now in practice it belongs to God. In the way Moses lives his life he realizes this belongs to God. God tells Moses that it's Moses' rod but now it is a new meaning because Moses is a steward of the rod of God. Exodus 4.20 Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and he returned to the land of Egypt and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. It suddenly had new meaning. It suddenly had new character. It suddenly was alive with power because Moses recognized who the true owner was. We find it later in Exodus 17, verse 9. Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And you know the story how when the rod was lifted, Israel beat Amalek. And when Moses got tired and the rod began to drop, Amalek beat Israel. And so Joshua and her stood on both sides of Moses and held his arms up till the going down of the sun in Israel, discomfited Amalek that day. The rod of God. When it was Moses' rod, it did nothing special. And Moses did nothing special with it. When it was the rod of God, it wrought miracles before Pharaoh. It split the Red Sea. It brought water out of a rock. It defeated the Amalekites. It was a symbol of power and authority when it became the rod of God. What do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? Don't give the stupid answer of earth. Look at what you have in your hand the way that God looks at it. What God could do with it. What effect it could have for eternity. What spiritual power and effect it could be have if it used the way God wants you to use it? What do you have in your hand? Is it your rod? Or is it the rod of God? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your power and for your word. And for your constant reminders to us that what we have is not ours, we are merely stewards. Our time, talent, energies, training, our money, our possessions, whatever it is that you've put into our hands, our time in history, our sphere of influence, the people we know and come in contact with, what is it we have in our hand? The opportunities, privileges, and responsibilities. What is it that we have in our hand? Do we look at it 
with the stupid answer of earth. Oh, what do we have in our hands? Stuff. Or do we look at it from the divine perspective? We are a rod in the hand of Almighty God, and what we have in our hand is a rod of which we are a steward. And God can use us, and he can use through us what we have in our hand for his glory and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Make us spiritually aware and perceptive in this blink of an eye that we call time and for which we will give an account through all eternity. Father, we commit these things to you and pray for your blessings on this, your word, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning.